If there was a godfather of venture capital, it would have to be Doug Leone. Few people outside of the Silicon Valley are aware of Doug's massive influence in building one of the most powerful institutions of the world, Sequoia Capital, a firm that since its founding in 1972 has backed startups that now command a staggering 1.4 trillion US dollar of combined stock market value, equivalent to 22% of Nasdaq. Doug Leone is not just influential, his street smarts have put him into billion dollar net worth territory. And in a world where people are getting more compliant while losing their characteristic edges, Doug is as raw of an underdog as you could imagine. When I first met Doug, I knew that uh, he was different than any other person I'd met in this whole in this whole venture industry. Well, I'd like to say a few things to start with. You use the word legendary. And let me tell you, that means almost dead. So let me get everybody's mindset right. I'd rather be a young associate trying to prove myself than legendary. Leone is born July 4th, 1957 in Genoa, Italy. His family moves to the United States when Leone is 11. When Doug Leone arrives in Mount Vernon, New York in 1968, the 11-year-old Italian immigrant doesn't have a clue. He flunks a math quiz in school because the terms true and false bewilder him. He wears unsightly slacks from Sears that invite classmates teasing. After school, he watches McHale's Navy alone on a black and white television, hoping to learn colloquial phrases that will help him fit in. <laughs> hey fella, look! Get lost, baby, we're being raided. <laughs> A few years later, Leone begins to get his bearings. He's working on boats as a teenager, sweating like a pig during his summer job. As he recalls, he can look across and see all the kids at the country club swimming pool. The young guys are talking to the girls and he's saying to himself, I can't wait until I meet you in the business world. You just made your big mistake letting me in. Ambition, vulnerability, vindication, lots of successful immigrants bottle up those feelings as they rise to prominence. They hide old slides and do their best to blend into America's aristocracy, not Leone. Even in his perch as a managing partner at venture firm Sequoia Capital, Leone still carries himself like a hard luck striver, scrambling for his first decent break. Because as he says, a lot of what keeps me going is fear. After getting bullied for many many years, Doug finally finishes high school. This experience makes him tougher, but he's also a different person than he was when he arrived in the US. He now speaks English quite well. And he will put some prestigious stamps on his CV. Leone earns a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Cornell University in 1979, a master's in industrial engineering from Columbia University School of Engineering and Applied Science in 1986, and a master's degree in management from the MIT Sloan School of Management in 1988. After graduating from Cornell University, he starts working for Hewlett Packard as a sales guy and luck strikes again. His sales district is also where Columbia Business School is based. But that location had one important thing, at Columbia University, where someone explained to me what the ARPANET was. That caused me to get a job at Sun Microsystems. Again, that crappy sales territory, and you could say I made my own break because I asked some questions, but that unlucky break led to a lucky break. Sun Microsystems employee number 50 something, I can't remember. The ARPANET was established as Advanced Research Projects Agency of the United States Department of Defense, and it is often considered to be the early predecessor of the internet. When in the early 1970s the first four nodes of the ARPANET became fully functional, things were a bit more complicated. Exchanging data between different computers, let alone different computer networks, was not as easy as it is today. But it is enough to get Leone more and more interested in the world 
of computers and internet. For a short time, he goes to work for a hot startup called Prime Computer, a producer of mini computers. Again, he chooses to work in a sales position, selling computers to Wall Street and making those sweet Benjamins. Maybe it is the intersection of technology and finance. Maybe it is him meeting one of the legendary silverback VCs at his job at Sun Microsystems, Vinod Kosla, co-founder of Sun Microsystems and founder of Kosla Ventures, a man who would deserve an entire based biography himself. Or maybe it is him taking a walk on 6th Avenue and wondering how the hell to generate massive amounts of wealth and afford all the luxury he is seeing around him. No matter what it is, Doug Leone forges a plan. He wants to work in venture capital. But even back then, chances of getting into VC are slim. It is a brand new industry and Doug has no Harvard on his CV. This is when he goes back to university and somehow manages to get into Columbia for a master's in industrial engineering. This then boosts his CV's prestige sufficiently to get accepted to an MBA at MIT. His approach to getting into VC is creative. He reaches out to all VC firms that are known to mankind at this point in time via written letters. And the VC gods give him the opportunity of his lifetime. Don Valentine of Sequoia accepts him for an interview. And so on 5 o'clock on a Monday, he gets interviewed by Don. And Don Valentine asks him exactly one question. What's important? <laughs> of course, I knew what's important. I spoke for about seven, eight minutes. I gave it, I, I mean, I gave it all. 30 seconds of silence, and he said, what else? Ah. <laughs> it's unclear how Doug was able to recover from that, but what is clear is that he got the job in the end. Don Valentine likes a couple of things about Leone, all of which are important to keep in mind for young ambitious gorillas trying to get into venture capital. His sales skills that he gained through the sales job he did, his hustler mentality as a young immigrant Chad that is willing to get his hands dirty, and his charisma that was undoubtedly also trained during his prior sales roles. And Doug is about to prove to Don that he made one of the best hiring choices imaginable. Normally as an angel investor, you invest in 20 companies and hopefully one of them does reasonably well and 10 or 20 access your money. Two or three will do okay and return a bit more than you invested and all the rest goes right down the drain. Doug Leone invests in three companies during his start at Sequoia and all three IPO'd. The truth is that Doug is so deep into network and software technology that he's able to distinguish future winners from from losers. If you want to learn something, look up his three wins, Renaissance Software, International Network Services and Arbor Hyperion. But prepare to spend a lot of time on understanding the business. To sum up Doug's early years at Sequoia, he joined Sequoia Capital in 1988 and becomes a managing partner in 1996. Enough said. He turned the partnership to a whole bunch of young investors. He just told us what he didn't want to do. In 1996, Doug Leone and Michael Moritz assume leadership of the firm. An incredible rise for an Italian immigrant that started from zero in a true testament of Don Valentine's leadership. Here's a little story that's in a book. Once I attended a presentation as an associate with Don. We left the presentation, Don left a note with green ink. He only wrote in green ink. He left that on a table for me to see. Doug, dash, not fit to listen to founders. Left that on a table for me to see. That was my feedback in the way I was questioning founders. Wow. You learn real fast. You know, you have safe spaces. I want feedback every Monday afternoon. Let me know if I'm doing okay. Let me tell you, that note from Don, was worth yeah. 20 of those meetings that we now have. And so right. I love the man. He gave me the shot of a lifetime. I respect him greatly. And uh, boy, he changed my life. He gave me a shot. But where there's light, there's darkness. 
and Doug Leone's early wins also built a false sense of confidence for him. He's about to experience his largest professional challenge yet. A challenge that will show the real values that Sequoia adheres by. And that challenge will come in 1999 during the dot-com bubble. The dot-com bubble refers to the period between 1995 and 2000 when investors pumped money into internet startups in the hopes that they would soon turn a profit. The speculative investments in these young startups, so-called dot-coms, drive up equity markets. The technology-centric Nasdaq index rises from less than 1000 in 1995 to a peak of 5408 on March 10th 2000. In the rush to cash in on the internet boom, many investors ignore traditional investment metrics such as the price to earnings ratio. Instead, they subscribe to a business model that favors building brand awareness and market share quickly, even if that requires offering services or products for discounted prices or for free. Low interest rates in 1998 helped drive up the amount of capital invested in dot-coms. The exuberance starts escalating, with many founders and investors making fortunes overnight when dot-coms went public. But as any Wall Street bets DGEN can attest, every bubble bursts at some point. And the bubble starts to burst in 1999. In 2000, companies such as Pets.com declare bankruptcy and by 2001 the bubble has fully burst, taking many dot-coms coms or dot bombs as investors start calling them with it. And there's shadows of this appearing again in 2022. A few years from now, we may be looking at last year's bull run as a swan song. One final flight for the economy as we knew it. No matter where you look, the numbers are historic and in the worst way. The 60-40 portfolio hasn't slumped like this in a whole century. Inflation is at its highest rate since the 1980s. The housing market is eerily aligning with the 2007 crash. Not to sound dramatic, but the clock seems like it's ticking for retail investors like you and me. The professionals have already made their move. There is a migration of wealth from traditional equities to alternative assets. That's right, according to McKinsey, on average wealth managers are allocating between 30 and 50% of their portfolios to alternatives. Now, historically, that'd be real estate, oil, precious metals, but there's new hedge in town. That's actually not new at all. It's fine art. While almost every traditional investment has slumped since this time last year, Morgan Stanley reports the average piece of fine art is selling for 26% more at auction. And Deloitte expects the art asset class to grow by 58%. This is why I'm thrilled to introduce our latest sponsor. Masterworks. For centuries, fine art was limited to the richest of the rich. With Masterworks, you can invest in works from household names for a fraction of the cost. Names like Banksy, Picasso, Warhol. You don't have to know fine art to understand Masterworks performance. In early October, Masterworks sold a painting for a 21.5% net return. In fact, six of their last seven exits, Masterworks delivered over 20% net returns to investors. No wonder over 500,000 people have signed up so far and they have a wait list. But my subscribers can skip the wait list at the link in the description. And Sequoia is not exempt from the action. In fact, their current dot-com crisis fund is doing so badly that the Sequoia partners learn the meaning of the word clawback. That is the industry lingo for the refund that venture capitalists are contractually obligated to make to investors if it turns out that the VCs pocketed more than their 20% share of the fund's overall profits. VCs can be required to pay clawbacks when they take their 20% share on a fund's early investment gains, which is a common practice, and later the overall fund loses money. This happens frequently after the technology bubble, which while it lasts, turns scores of young companies into skyrocketing stocks. The clawback provision means that many VC funds ultimately lose money, even though some of their initial investments were profitable. Leone has 
war room meetings in the Sequoia headquarters. It is so bad that some Sequoia partners owe more than their net worth to limited partners. How can they get themselves out of that? Most of the other venture capital firms choose to capitulate. Take the loss on the current fund, raise a new fund and start earning money through the fees again. But Sequoia doesn't want to take the easy path. Similar to the car manufacturer Ford that would refuse to accept government bailouts in 2008, Sequoia wants to make it on their own by sheer hustle. No one is going to lose money at Sequoia Capital. So they take funds that for example were 0.3x, meaning if it was a 100 million US dollar fund, it was currently worth only 30 million US dollar. In other words, investors in the fund have lost 70 million of US dollar through their investment. And Sequoia does the impossible by bringing them up to close to 2x. By giving up fees, not earning anything from the fund, but reinvesting all the money into the startups and helping the startups on the ground to stay alive. The pride from having been able to pull off such a turnaround is going to form Sequoia's culture for years. And for years to come, Doug Leone will tell clients that these times are some of the proudest moments in the history of Sequoia Capital. It is not the moments when you are on top, having invested in Google or Cisco, but it is the moments when you are at the bottom, in deep red territory, that define who you really are as a firm. In 2012, Mike steps down as a CEO of Sequoia due to health reasons. Consequently, in this duo, there was just Doug left and he becomes the global managing partner at Sequoia. Fast forward to recent times. In 2017, Forbes names Leone a top 10 investor in the technology industry in the United States. He leads Sequoia's international expansion into China and India, which are considered to have been very important steps for the firm's global dominance. People should know that one, we have a group of partners in China, they make local decisions. And I also want people to know that for the last, I wanna say 13 years, there's never been a dime extra that anybody in the US made from China, meaning that we contribute to a pool, they contribute to a pool, and we all take the money out, so we get a bag of mixed nuts, but it's the same dollar value. Leone was responsible for investments, including ServiceNow, Aruba, Meraki, Rackspace, and MedExpress. He sits on the board of PlanGrid, NewBank, ActionIQ, Numerify, and Lettuce Engines. In 2017, he is ranked number 693 on Forbes' list of the world's billionaires, with a net worth of 2.9 billion. In 20. 20, he's named on the Forbes billionaire list with a wealth of 3.5 billion. Pretty solid for a young, ambitious Italian immigrant. And my life really went into, into three different groups. In the first few years, it was about making it. Can I make it? Can I make it? Can I make it? From the age of 35 to 50, I just wanted to be the very best. That really, really drove me. From 50, 55 to this point, to 57, and hopefully through the end of my career, the thing that really, really drives me is working with younger people. It's a it's kind of a rude line, but I don't want to hang out with people like me. I don't want to hang out with old people. I want to hang out with people like you. Uh, and so at Sequoia Capital, finding a young, talented partner, investor, employee, and helping them in the greatest way possible is really what keeps me going now. And Leone offers a perfect lesson for young ambitious gorillas trying to find their place on the top of the food chain and becoming massively rich and building their own legacy. So I think entrepreneurs like investors come in different flavors. And I will tell you, and as I told my kids, that if you're desperate, it's a great asset. If you have too many choices in life, it clouds your thinking. When you only have one way to go and that's forward, it's very easy. You just go, go, go. Failure truly is not an option. Now, what we look for in entrepreneurs is people that have not followed the, the same tracks. People that, that have done quirky things, that have taken risks. We look for that. Uh, we look for people that have knowledge in the domain 
not so much the best of minded a business because they want to make some money. We actually look for people that are very interested in their product or service being used by the next 10, 20 million people. And we also look for people, a little secret, that solve a problem that they have. And it just so happened, they don't know it, we don't know it, but they're the proxy for the next 20 million users. So Jan, a WhatsApp, understood privacy and low cost messaging. He had that need. He started WhatsApp. Well, the founders of Yahoo from Stanford couldn't find anything on the internet, so they built a search engine, they built a Yellow Pages, or something as simple as Zappos. The founder of Zappos couldn't find a pair of shoes. And so we look for people that, that are trying to solve problems that they themselves have. If we see that, that's a little tell for us that we may be onto something because we may find our first beta site, the founder for the next generation. And once you get started on a project that will hopefully cement your status as a legendary business silver back, pay attention to these two common hurdles. Raise as little as you can to get you to something that you can show, plus maybe a quarter or two, so you have a little bit of cushion, and then raise some more money. Raise as little, not as much, as little as you can. Because that's the most expensive equity you're gonna sell. Raise as little and, as you can. And Conversely, be very generous with the early engineers that you hire. Those are the ones you should invest in. Because the first two or three engineers, if you get those wrong, you are done. So we all should become engineers is what you're no, saying. No, <laughs> no, because if you're building a technical product, an A plus engineer is gonna help you to recruit an A engineer. If your first two or three engineers are B engineers, you're done because you'll never surround yourself with, 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 the, A ten, you know, with the A and A plus talented people. And finally, during all of this pursuit, you want to strive towards your goals, not as a beta, but as a true leader. So I'm gonna take a different approach I'm going to share with you what I think leadership is, and then I'll give you an example afterwards. And as everything in life, things uh, can be boiled down to very simple two or three items or entities. So to me, leadership is three things. It's vision, it's execution, and it's culture. You only have vision, and you get called a visionary. That's the only thing you have. You can't execute. You only execute you're called a manager. If you're lucky, you're called an executive. And if you set up a lousy culture, then you're called an asshole. 